Okay, we're very happy to have uh, Raffaele Dandolo, all the way from, from Slack. And he's going to tell us how to learn new physics from a machine. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So yeah, today we'll tell you about uh, some work that we recently posted with Andrea Hulzer at CERN. And uh, I will give you one slide of motivation, then the first half of the talk is a very, very basic introduction to neural networks. And if I'm boring you at any point, I can skip ahead, so let me know. And then the second part of the talk is going to be about this uh, uh, new way of looking for new physics model independently in big data sets. So if you have a model, like the standard model that you know describes the bulk of your data set, and you want to look for any possible deviation without making any assumption on whatever is producing a discrepancy, I think that this is the way to go. And I'll also show you comparisons with other similar ideas that appeared uh, shortly afterwards. OK, so my one slightly dumb slide of motivation is the following. So well, if anyone had asked you until a few years or decades ago where you think that new physics would manifest itself, you probably have said around the weak scale. So your prior was very big. And it made complete sense to build one large collider to look in that very spot. Today, I mean, depending on who you ask, you can be more or less to the right of this arrow. So your prior is slowly becoming more uniform in a log space, both in energy and in coupling, which is unfortunate. And in this context, I find reasonable both to build the one or more large colliders or to build many small experiments. So the, 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 option, I mean, the, the advantage of building one large collider is that even if you don't find anything, you end up learning something, like X potential or electric variogenesis or things like that. On the other hand, I mean, if your prior is really logarithmic in energy, you cover much more territory per dollar with many small experiments. On the other hand, if you don't find anything there, you don't learn that much. So, both possibilities seem reasonable at this stage, but both possibilities seem way less exciting than LAC or LHC were uh, before they were built. And today I'm going to do something kind of in between these two possibilities. So take the large collider that we already have and cover as much logarithmic space in energy coupling, shape of the signal, whatever you want. <clears throat> okay. Uh, to be a bit more concrete, let me state uh, my, the, the problem that I want to solve uh, in a uh, toy setup. So let's say that I have a big data set that I've collected experimentally, and I have a reference model that in our case can be the standard model, but it could also be lambda CDM uh, in cosmology. And you know that in the bulk, most of the, these events follow the reference model. But you would like to know uh, if there is any statistically significant discrepancy in this data set or if, they act, or if this data set actually follows the reference model. And right now, the only way you have to do this model independently is to bin these events, as I did here, and then do a simple chi-square comparison of your bin histogram with your reference model. And if you do this in this very simple setup, you get that your chi-square is 47, you have 50 bins, which means that the data exactly follow the reference model. The, the statistical significance for having something discrepant is less than one sigma. However, I mean, if you knew exactly where to look, uh, instead you would find uh, a discrepancy that is order five sigma. So you have discovered something. But let me stress that you would have to know exactly where to look. So this five sigma is true if you know uh, what distribution actually generated this uh, data set. And if you, can, if, you, if you know that, then you can construct this variable uh, that is a likelihood ratio or a test statistic or whatever you want to call it, which gives you, in some sense, the ideal significance. So you cannot do better than this. And this is just the ratio between the probability distribution that generated the, the data, the probability distribution of the model that you want to test. So this R is the reference model. And this factor here is just the Poisson fluctuation of the number of events. And there is also, looking just at this uh, very simple example, you know, you just know that there must be something in between, right? I mean, it's impossible that there is no better way than the chi-square. Um, and there is a very simple reason why the chi-square is failing here. It's just that each bean can have Poisson fluctuation. So on average, each bean contributes to the chi-square of order one. So even if you have like an order 10 discrepancy in the tail, you might think that uh, 
this is perfect in agreement. And the more bins you have, so the weakest your prior is for where your physics should be, and then the least performing this high score test becomes. Because I mean, if you generalize from this one dimensional space to I don't know, a 10 dimensional space in some reasonable LHC search where you have many particle momenta, then these bins, instead of being 50, become uh, 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 10 or even more. And then, even if you have a huge signal that is, I don't know, maybe you have one bin that is a thousand times larger than the standard model, you will never see it this way. And uh, what I'm going to tell you in the following is precisely uh, to bridge the gap between uh, uh, this chi square test and this uh, ideal significance where you know everything. And the basic picture will be very simple. So, since the problem are Poisson fluctuations, you will want to replace this histogram that fluctuates with something smooth. And neural networks offer you that something smooth. And we'll see that in about 20 minutes. Before, I'm going to tell you what are neural networks from my theorist perspective. And as I said, this is a very basic introduction. Uh, if you know already machine learning, you're going to know everything I'm going to say. So stop me if, uh, if I get boring. All right, so a neural network is often thought of as a black box by uh, people that haven't worked with it. But in reality, it's a very, very simple object. It's just uh, a set of functions that depend on some free parameters and a fitting algorithm that allows you to fix these free parameters in order to reproduce uh, uh, the function that you're interested in approximating. Uh, all the magic lies in the fact that these functions are nested. That's all. I mean, uh, at step one, this could be as well a real transform as far as you know, and in fact, it's not very different. Uh, the, the real key difference is that this basis of function is constructed in a way that is not very familiar to us, usually. Uh, more, more concretely, uh, the functions that you usually nest are of two, two types. So you have a linear transformation that depends on these three parameters I was mentioning, and then you have a nonlinear transformation that is fixed. And so the easiest thing to think about these two transformations is to put them together in one unit that people call neuron. So you can imagine this unit taking some n-dimensional input and spitting out uh, input of some other dimension. Here I, I've just used a scalar for simplicity. And these parameters here are usually called weights and these others are usually called biases. And once you have this unit, oh sorry, one more thing, so this nonlinear transformation have, have a typical form. So they, most of them look like, look like this. They separate at some large positive and negative values of their argument, and they have an exponential turn on in the middle. So the ones that I use most often are this logistic sigmoid, which I'm going to use in the following, or this hyperbo hyperbolic tangent, and they both look like this. This guy is a bit different, but uh, it still has this turn on, only it doesn't saturate on one side. And in a couple of slides, you'll see why this is the form that is preferred for the nonlinear transformations. Okay, so. If you have one of these units, you can glue it together with many others to build your network. And here, I've sketched what's the most used setup, which is a feedforward fully connected network. It's feedforward because the information goes only in one direction. So you have your input to your first layer of neurons, goes then into your second, and so on. And uh, layers that are farther away to, the, to your right never talk back to layers that are of course, this is not a rule. I mean, this is just the simple setup, and there can be infinite variations. But these are the kind of networks that I'm going to use uh, in the rest of the talk. And it's also called fully connected because, as you can see from these arrows that are not very easy to follow by eye, the output of a neuron in layer I, say, goes to all the neurons in layer J. And if you try to write down the function that this uh, diagram corresponds to, it starts rapidly to look pretty nasty. So you might think that uh, you can hardly understand anything analytically about this object, but actually, uh, if we step back for a moment, it's not too hard uh, to understand what's going on. So why these machines are efficient at approximating arbitrary functions. And the reason, at least heuristically, is very simple. There are also theorems that one can prove, but I will just give you the heuristic derivation. So let's say that you have two neurons, and their output goes to a third one. And let me, for simplicity, imagine a one-dimensional input. 
<coughs> then this third neuron is summing the two inputs that, as a function of x, look like this. Huh? If you increase the weight in these two neurons, the uh, input to the third one is going to become sharper and sharper. And if you move uh, the bias, uh, these two curves are going to shift left and right. So then <coughs> you can fix the weights in these three neurons so that these curves are sound. And so all you're doing in this three neuron setup is to build peaks that can be broad and smooth, or can be narrow and sharp, or can go all the way to becoming rectangular functions. So in reality, all the network is doing is putting tiny rectangles underneath curves in a smart way. So uh, you, you'll see uh, in a moment how it decides what's, what are the sizes of this rectangle. So if it sees like a very smooth distribution, it's going to put a very broad feature there. If it sees a sharp feature, it's going to put a, a sharp peak. But in reality, the way the neural networks are approximating functions, which is all they're doing, is by putting tiny rectangles underneath them like you would do in elementary calculus when you try to visualize how an integral is performed. So, <clears throat> this, uh, just to stress that in reality these are relatively simple objects, and this concludes the first part of the introduction to neural networks. So this is all I'm going to say about this set of functions that defines the network. Of course, there will be much more to say, and if you want, I can expand on different architectures, etc., etc., but this is all I'm going to use, so for our purposes, it's more than enough. And now, uh, I'll, I'll tell you how the three parameters that uh, enter these neurons, so these weights and biases, are determined. And the way they're determined is following elementary statistics. So when you have uh, a set of data, x, and a set of three parameters, theta, and you want to determine the parameters, you do a maximum likelihood fit. You write down the probability <coughs> that your model describes the data and you maximize it and the value of the parameters for which you reach the maximum of this probability is an est a good estimator of your parameters. And this estimate has a series of uh, uh, nice properties that are well known that I'm not going to talk about. And uh, there is a one, I'm uh, sorry, one more thing which is that Computationally, it's usually better to use the log of this probability just because uh, since this is really a product of uh, many probabilities, you can easily have one that is very small and that would create your problems with convergence numerically. So typically, you work with the log of the likelihood and that's also what I'm going to do in the following. Um, and there is a very simple one-to-one -one correspondence between these elementary statistics and neural networks. So your parameters are the weights and biases I've been talking about, and uh, the likelihood function in machine learning literature is called loss function, they take a minus, they prefer to minimize it, but it's really the same thing. And your data that allow you to do the fit are, is, are called training sample. So let me give you a, a concrete example of this, which is kind of a classic. So let's say you want your network to uh, output one, when you uh, give it as an input the picture of a cat and output zero when you give it as an input the picture of a dog. Then all you need to do is to write the appropriate likelihood function, which as usual, I mean, it's more of an art than a science. I mean, you just write a function, or a more precisely a functional, that at the minimum gives you the answer that you want, and you hope that it's also the most efficient to be minimized. And here, okay, I've done just the simplest thing that came to mind. So I, I wrote down a chi-square, and you can easily check that uh, at the minimum of this chi-square, the network precisely gives you one when it sees the picture of a cat, and it gives you zero when it sees the picture of a dog. <coughs> and the way you find the minimum of this functional is also pretty simple. So you just take derivatives with respect, with respect to your three parameters, and then you, you move in the direction uh, towards which this derivatives decrease. So this is called gradient descent and was proposed by Cauchy in 1847 and it's still the standard of the field, so nothing uh, crazy going on. The only difference between uh, 1847 and today is that if today you have a, 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 a data set of a million cut pictures, you will never be in practice able to compute this function over the whole field. So what they do is that they extract a random a subsample 
and they compute this function on a subsample exactly at random, then they take the derivative, move a little bit in the right direction, then extract another subsample at random and keep going like this. And uh, the small steps that they make are called learning related. So this is the basic algorithm that is behind uh, all uh, neural network training, which is the same as doing a maximum likelihood fit. And there are many variations, but they're not conceptually different in any way from this. So this is really the basis, and then, okay, you can have a learning rate that changes adaptively as you go on and things like that, but the basic idea is always this. And it's very simple. So, um, this uh, whole uh, uh, first part of the talk was just uh, to demystify neural networks in some sense, to show the people that were not familiar that they're actually very simple objects, no more than a set of functions, and a way to fit uh, whatever function you want to approximate to your basis, nothing more than that. And now uh, I will tell you about uh, how we want to use them. And so, uh, as I was anticipating at the beginning, the problem with the chi-square test was that the beans in the histogram fluctuate. But if you can somehow replace the beans with something smooth, then you're probably on the right track to find a deviation model independently, even if this deviation is small compared to the total number of beans. And uh, what the neural networks do for us is precisely this. So they replace uh, the beans with this smooth approxima. And here you see an example, again, taken from the toy, the toy model at the beginning, where the network is precisely doing what it's supposed to do. So in the bulk, where there are many events, it follows nicely the standard model. And then uh, in the tail, it manages to see that the true data distribution is actually different <coughs> from the standard model. And so the first step uh, of our, let's call it, algorithm or strategy is precisely to have the network learn the true data distribution or approximate it. And then, well, the second step is also pretty easy to guess. You just want to check if this data distribution is the same as the standard model one or if it's different. And the way we do it is quite standard. I'm going to go more into the details in a few slides, but uh, for those familiar with hypothesis tests, you just, again, build a likelihood ratio. On the top, you have the data distribution learned by the network. On the bottom, the standard model. You use this as a discriminating variable. And uh, you first compute a number on the data that I'm going to call the observed value of this variable. And then you compute many values of this uh, number. Yes? Sorry. Well, I just wanted to know, when, you, when you're learning the data, does the, does the algorithm know about, I mean, in, in your example, some of those bins are have much smaller errors, statistical errors, than others, right? Does the, does the algorithm care about that? Yes, yes. So, so um, you, it, yes. So it know what, what it's able to do is to reproduce precisely the data distribution when you have enough data. I mean, so it, it's going to reproduce it within the statistical error every time. But I mean, if you have like in, in you know in, in, in bins where there's a significant statistical error, yes. somehow it, it, the, you you would get very large fluctuations, and you wouldn't want to be fitting those. So, well, you would yes. Well, so the the, the or is that coming that's the where I was step? getting out to follow. here. So so it is going to fit the fluctuations, but it's not an issue because uh, so in the end you want this algorithm to give you a p value, right? So if you compute the p-value correctly, then these statistical fluctuations are taken into account by the fact that when you go and compute this discriminating variable on the standard model, it's going to be large, as in the data, right? So let's say you were fitting only fluctuations. Then when you compute this test statistic on the standard model using the same procedure, okay. the network would fit so fluctuations also there, and right. so that guarantees that your p-value is correct. Um, but it is, okay, so that's what I want to do. So it's just not at the first stage. At the first stage, just whatever data you include, the neural network is just going to take that as the exact, you know. Yes, exactly. It's not going but to but it depends it also, yeah. so how much you are fitting this fluctuation depends on the size of the network, which sadly I have to talk about at the end. But uh, so the, the size of the network, in some sense, it's what determines everything because it tells you how many free parameters you are. So how many distinct functions you are able to span, in some sense. So 
you can imagine that the network is testing a huge but finite amount of BSM hypotheses against the standard model. And if you have enough parameters, one of these hypotheses is following all the data, right? right. So you can beam this data so thinly that uh, you have only zeros and ones. And if you have enough parameters, you can do that in principle. And uh, what happens in my setup if you do that? It's not that you think that you found new physics every time, but you, you think that you've never found it. Because uh, since we're computing the p-value correctly, you do that also for the standard model. And so you go back to, essentially, go back to the chi-square, but with infinite, well, not infinite, but with a huge amount of bits. <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, so ultimately the size of the network will determine the sensitivity and I'm going to talk about it towards the end. Uh, but for now, uh, we just give you the basic, the basic steps uh, of the process. So, uh, as you might have noticed, I keep talking about this uh, standard model distribution. But of course, we don't know it explicitly. It's not that we have an analytic function that tells us what the standard model looks like when a delete is really do a certain measurement. So in practice, uh, what we do is that uh, we give the network uh, a standard model sample that is very large, so we imagine it that it's generated via Monte Carlo, and then a data sample that is just the size of the data sample, whatever it is that you've collected at LHC, or in the CMD, or whatever. Uh, then you pass it to the network, which gives, spits out, and I'll tell you in a minute how it does it, uh, two things. So this value of the test statistic that I was talking about before, which is going to tell you whether you found new physics or not. But then also something else that's very useful, which is the ratio of the probability distributions <coughs> between the data and the standard model. So uh, when I was saying, sorry, when I was saying here that we are learning the data distribution, I was actually lying. More correctly, the network is learning directly the ratio between data and standard model. So that let's say you find something and you want to convince yourself that it's not this cell fluctuation or some systematic effect or whatever. Then if you find something, then you go back to this uh, and you plot as many plots as you can and compare them to the data and see if, I don't know, the region where this ratio, so this ratio now is the log. So it's zero when they're the same and it deviates when they're not the same. So you look for deviations from zero in this ratio everywhere in the parameter space that you're interested in and you check if Effectively, yes, these are systematics or not. So the preference sample is just like theoretical prediction? Yes. Okay. Exactly. So it's not, because suppose that standard model is 100% correct, you would still not measure that, right? But that's not the reference sample, uh, including. Uh, sorry, say that back. Sorry. No, I just, uh, the reference sample is directly just taking three level or one loop or whatever is relevant for the process and. And then yeah, you you put it into the detector simulation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes. so today I'm not going to talk about it, but there is also a straightforward way to include errors so in every okay. systematic statistical are already accounted for. So the already there. Yeah. yeah, systematics can be included. I'm not going to tell you about it unless you ask towards the end. But there is a there is a way. I mean, you just uh, instead so the. Yeah, it's going to become more clear in the following, but uh, all the errors are here in the end. So in the distribution of this test statistic in the standard model hypothesis. So <clears throat> to include systematics, you just, uh, when you pass the, so okay, let, me, let me get to it, because otherwise it becomes more confusing. But uh, so when I tell you how to compute this, it will become clear how to include the errors. Okay, so this is the basic sketch of what, what's going on. No? Uh, yeah, so before going into some more details, uh, quick notation. So I, I've been talking about probability distributions and I recall them little n. And the only reason is that uh, I normalize them to the total number of events. So when you see little n, they're normalized to the total number of events. When you see p, they're actual probabilities. Uh, and then, well, you've already seen R everywhere. That's the reference model of the standard model. And p is new physics. This t means true. So Presumably a true data distribution, and whenever you see a W1, this means that it's something that the network has learned. So, for example, if an R is the number of events in the standard model that you expect in the signal region you're looking at, this NW1 is what the network thinks the total number of events in the data are. Okay, so having said this, now I want to translate this sketch into an actual training problem from the network. Um, 
which is probably the, less, the least interesting part for most of you, but it's the main uh, machine learning novelty in this world, so I'm going to spend at least one slide on it. And it's really simple. So uh, <coughs> ideally, uh, what we want to do is to use a loss function that is also the likelihood ratio. Because we know from elementary statistics that the likelihood ratio is the best possible discriminant, at least asymptotically. <coughs> and so if our loss function is this very same likelihood ratio, somehow, to some extent, we're guaranteed that we're doing a reasonable thing, that we're trying to minimize or maximize, depending on what sign you like to put in front, uh, the quantity that best discriminates between the data and the reference model. And it's actually pretty straightforward to uh, translate this uh, uh, ratio of likelihoods into a loss function. All we did uh, was just to parameterize the two data distribution as the reference one times what an exponential of what the network learns. Then we plug it in in the likelihood ratio, and if you just do one line of algebra, you get this expression. So this uh, is literally just the two data distribution parameterized this way. <coughs> this uh, is literally just the log of the Poisson giving you the number of giving you the fluctuations of the total number of events in the standard model. And this piece here is uh, uh, the number of events that the network thinks there are in the data written as a Monte Carlo integral. If you want, I mean, I can do, I can show you on the blackboard why this expression is correct, but I mean, the whole point here is that we can write this likelihood ratio as a sum, as a two separate sums. One on events coming from the reference sample and one on events coming from the data. And uh, so we have the loss function that we desire. So, yes. So I, I, I would like to understand this, but I'm, I'm, I'm very confused. So, so if we, uh, because here you're, you're making, you're using a reference model, yes. but I thought in the end you want to do something that does not refer to any reference model. No, the reference model has to be, I mean, you need, I don't want to refer to any alternative model. So I want to know if our prediction for what the net data should look like, so the standard model, is actually realized in the data or not. So what I don't want is an alternative new physics hypothesis, right? So if you look uh, at all the searches that are done now, uh, you're always setting a bound on some scenario, right? right. Which means that you're doing this, but uh, instead of uh, adding a denumerator, some unspecified function that you're fitting, you have a very precise function that you've chosen a priori, right? So I'm sorry, the reference function model is the standard model. So yes. This is just fitting to the standard model. The, well, it, yes, in some sense, in some sense it is. Except, so you're, except you're sort of anti-fitting, you're trying to discriminate. Exactly. You, you have the reference sample, which is the Monte Carlo, the standard model, and, the, and you're trying to discriminate as much as possible, but you would like the actual loss function to be numerically determined by the likelihood. Yes, exactly, right. exactly. So I have these two samples. Okay. Well, sorry, uh, I'm just being I'm, slow. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and I want to learn uh, the ratio of the probability distributions that they're coming from. Okay. And I want to do it in such a way that this is maximally sensitive to deviations from uh, this, sample, of this sample, from this sample. Right. And so I use this likelihood ratio, which is the best discriminant between the two samples. Of course, I use it like symbolically, right? So I don't know this function, and this is what I'm fitting, so... Mm -hmm. okay. Quite often, uh, these professors don't, well, they cannot really trust the Monte Carlo, right? So people use sidebands, ABC... Yes. And then... Yeah, so, so, so uh, if you think about uh, the most ambitious way possible of applying this method, uh, then I completely agree with this objection. I mean, if you really want to do a completely model independent search on all the data at the LHC, like say choosing as input the four vectors of all the particles in each event, then it's never going to work. So the, the way I see this actually working is uh, you choose a signal region with some number of variables, I don't know, from two to 50, and then you measure the backgrounds in that signal region in the usual ways that you described. So you measure your systematics in a traditional way, and then you use as input to this uh, algorithm 
the standard model prediction with the systematics that you painstakingly measured in the usual way plus the data. So yeah, so this, this is the way I think in the end this might work. So what I thought, just sorry, just following up on that, um, I thought that that you know the 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 that when 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 they they do these things right, mm -hmm. the, they're not really uh, getting. They, they, at least one of the things I've heard from experimentalists is that they worry about uh, uh, you know looking at too many correlations because they're not really sure they understand they, if they've modeled them correctly or taken them into account. I mean these these background methods that they use, I thought, you know, were basically designed just to get systematic errors in, you know, a small number of distributions. So is that, well, do you think that's not the case, or? Um, well, yes and no, I mean, in the sense that, uh, so first, uh, uh, even if it was the case, I mean, I think it would still be interesting to apply these to, you know, five or six variables, I mean, let, let's, let's take a search as it is done now, right? Uh, usually the signal region boils down to a single variable, but uh, typically you know the systematics in more than that. I mean, you can think about five or six distributions. So at zero order, you could just take that as it is now, and instead of checking for the presence of one model that you like, doing this, and so you replace essentially the last step of all existing searches with this, which is uh, looking for everything in some sense, more than independently. Of course, there is a catch of looking for everything, but it's the Lucasro effect that I'm going to talk about. Right. But, I mean, uh, even if the sensitivity overall is low, it's still much greater than zero, which is what you would have if you look for one model and yeah. not for I guess maybe another way to ask uh, the question is just, I mean, I don't think experimentalists ever try to find, I mean, well, maybe I'm wrong, but I think my pre at least in simple cases, do they would they know the correlations between systematic errors, right? Just like with, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. But I mean, that that's something delicate to be discussed case yeah. by case. But I don't know. I can give you many reasonable examples in which I think this would make complete sense. So, say you have a signal region with uh, I don't know two leptons and three jets for example, right? So then the input variables to this algorithm could be uh, the four moment of these five objects. So it's already 20 variables. So there might be some uh, index structure that you don't see by eye, but this thing will see. Then I think that there, when the systematics is relatively straightforward. So you know that the systematics on the lepton are almost completely uncorrelated from the systematics on the jets. You know which of the systematics on the jets are correlated between each other, so if you, if you change the jet energy scale, of course you're changing all of them. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I could, yeah. I could go in more detail, but uh, right. no, that's good. you see. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so, um, yeah, so as I was saying, uh, now we have our loss function, precisely in the form that we wanted it to have. Um, and, uh, <coughs> Again, so re recapping everything, uh, we are, since the loss function is also a test statistic, you don't even need to compute the test statistic again, you're just done at the end of training. The network is learning this log ratio by design between the data and the standard model. And uh, one small technical point is that uh, if you look at this loss function, it's actually unbounded from below, which is pretty bad if you want to minimize it. And the reason is that, let's say that you have one data point in a region where you have no points in the reference. Then this thing would, would like to make this guy as large as possible, and so you get a runaway direction. However, there is a natural way to regulate this, which is the fact that since you have finite experimental resolution, also your derivatives should be finite, so the derivatives of, of this function. So if you put an upper bound on these weights, which are those that uh, control these derivatives, then uh, this will be bounded and will be fine. And you can be, I mean, in an ideal case, you can be completely general and just put a bound that limits you as much as the experimental resolution limits you, so you're not really putting any extra theoretical constraint. 
Okay, so uh, for the machine learning practitioners, uh, you might wonder why I'm using that weird loss function, although I try to motivate it, rather than something more traditional. So uh, what I'm doing in machine learning terms is just a likelihood ratio trick. So I'm using a classifier to learn a likelihood ratio, and this is a pretty standard technique. Only typically they use this kind of loss functions. That this one is called cross entropy, and the only useful feature is that they have logs, and so they solve a problem uh, with minimization that is kind of uh, frequent in these kind of setups. Since you have all these exponentials from these logistic functions that I was showing, your derivatives tend to go to zero. And so if you put logs, uh, at least uh, you solve this problem for the last step. And so this is the standard of the community for, uh, uh, for loss functions. And you can easily show that you can write down one that gives you the exact same minimum that uh, mine gives you. And the reason we are not using it, I mean, is twofold. One, because we think that this one is more motivated. And two, I mean, we just checked that in all the examples that we tested, this performs worse than the other one. So, uh, end of the story, this was simple. Okay, so this concludes uh, the first part. So I told you how we learn the data distribution, in reality, a ratio, not really the data distribution. And now I'm gonna tell you this part, which, uh, Again, in statistics it's pretty standard, but uh, I will go through it in some detail. Um, so the first thing that you want to do uh, is to compute this probability distribution of the test statistic in the standard model hypothesis. The reason is that otherwise you just have one number and you don't really know what to do with it. So what you would like to know is what, what is the probability that this data set follows the standard model. Yes. So, can I ask you, so this uh, machine it doesn't matter that it was some particle scattering. So if you just take random functions with random bumps, it would still do yes, the same thing. which is what I did. <laughs> so, but is there any constraint like saying that it must actually come from particles? For example, that you can write some effective Lagrangian and you can take dimension five, six, seven of and somehow it must be come from that or there's if, no such a... So if you want, you can try to build in this constraint. We did that. Um, but does it give any well, strain, in, actually? In the end, not, not a lot. I mean, it, I haven't thought about this very deeply, but uh, the, the thing that I can tell you is that uh, things that are weird uh, from uh, a Lagrangian perspective that maybe uh, na naively violate causality, they look very non-analytic in this shape. So they look like, I don't know, you have an infinite derivative somewhere. But in this case, in practice, you can never tell whether the derivative is infinite or it's the same as the experimental resolution. So, mm -hmm. as, at least as far as this particular thing goes, uh, already just the bound on the weights is enough. Uh, then, I mean, you might uh, be, mm, you might think about, I don't know, momentum conservation or, or these kind of things. But in some sense, uh, it's already encoded in the data, right? So all that the network is trying to do is, try, is trying to approximate uh, the, 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 the experimental outcome of uh, whatever you've done, say, at the LHC, right? So it's trying to approximate distribution with smooth curves. So if your distribution comes from events that conserve energy, in some <laughs> sense, the network is never going to violate energy conservation. But it, has, it, it doesn't have built-in uh, uh, a condition that prevents you from doing it. So, okay, but it was a bit of a convoluted answer, but the, the short answer is that no. There are no built-in constraints. You can put them in if you want, but I, I suspect that they're not going to change much. Okay so, um, so, okay, so now you've done, let's say you've done uh, all uh, your training, and so now you have a number uh, that you observe in the data for this test statistic. So now, what you do is that you repeat the process, giving the network, instead of one big standard model sample and one small data sample, you give it one big standard model sample and one small standard model sample. So that the network is doing exactly the same it's doing on the data, but this time on some data that are fake, there are some toy data that you generated according to the standard model. And if you do this many times, this gives you the probability distribution of the test statistic in the hypothesis that the data are distributed like the standard model. 
And so you get some histogram like this, for example. And from this, finally, you can get a probability. So now you can ask, what's the probability of seeing this value for the test statistic is if my data are standard model like. And you can compute a p-value in the usual way by integrating from t observed to infinity. And this comes from, again, from the usual simple one-dimensional example I was doing before, where the standard model is a falling exponential, and the data are a falling exponential plus a peak in the data. <coughs> sorry, can I, can I, can I, um, sorry to keep interrupting you, but kind sure, of, no, no. So, so, so suppose you had a sample that had uh, a couple of peaks, okay, yes. but uh, let's say just say two peaks, one of them was really a statistical fluctuation, right? Mm -hmm. And the other one was was, yes. was real. Now, now if your uh, now your 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 I guess you would want your the size of your neural network to fit both of them, right? Yes. But it doesn't know which one to fit. So you know, so I'm I guess what I'm thinking thinking of is that how if there's if there's if there are both features that are you know. That are due to fluctuations and ones that are uh, that are due to, to some real deviation. Do you have to have your your neural network fit all of them? Because the first step, it doesn't know how significant they are, right? That's what you said. Yes. Said. So so we are going back to the yes. So this goes back to the question of what's the right size of the network, right? So yeah, I guess in, so, in, yeah. in typical, so if, if your network is small. It might be forced to fit only one peak, and then it would just fit the one that in that particular one. sample is the most statistically significant. But how do if you... you're doing okay. training properly, because it might just happen that, I mean, the way these things are done is that you start with some random configuration of the weights, and then you start moving around with these derivatives, right? So there is no guarantee that you're going to get to the global minimum. And this is just a fact of life, because these functions are non convex, so there are no algorithms that can guarantee you that you get to a global minimum. So it might be that you're unlucky and that uh, from the configuration we're starting from, the minimum of this giant configuration space that was fit in the peak that was a fluctuation was closer by in some sense, and you would end up there. So, um, so in other words, there is no guarantee that you're going to fit the right peak. Um, but if you have a large enough network, you're guaranteed that you're going to fit both. So, so towards the end, I will tell you how to make sure that you have a large enough network in some sense. So in traditional machine learning applications, this problem is very easy because uh, you know what you're looking for in some sense, right? You have your set of cats, your set of dogs, and uh, you can just check the performances on another set of cats and another set of dogs. Here, you have no idea what you're looking for. So in principle, you have to have a way of deciding how big the network should be, looking only at the standard model, which by definition is not going to be optimal. There is saying no that if, if, but you remind me that if you do find the, if you could find the exact global minimum of your neural network, it would maximize the likelihood. So in that sense, it would actually already kind of know which ones are the statistical fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Well, in practice, that may be a problem. Right? Yes, if the network is large enough, right? Because um, you might just not have enough parameters to fit both fluctuations. Right. Okay? So it's going to find the maximum of that likelihood. But maybe, so maybe the maximum of that likelihood is, I don't know, let's say you have a peak here in one year, but, and not enough pre parameters, maybe you're going to see something that looks like this. So it's, yeah, so it's not guaranteed in any way a priori that you're going to find a shape that really looks like your signal. Uh, but that's, in some sense, inevitable. So since you're not looking for a particular signal, but you're looking for everything, you have no a priori way of optimizing the size of the network to really see everything. So if you have a hint of the number of features you're looking for, then you can. But if you don't have anything, then you have somehow to find the best size given your standard model. And then hope that it's enough uh, to fit uh, whatever nature throws at you. Or, I mean, you can do this more than one time with different architectures. That's another possibility. But, in, but yeah, what I want to say is that uh, it's just impossible to do, I mean, it's conceptually not possible to have the optimal network when you don't know what you're looking for. That's, uh, 
but that's true in general. I mean, whatever modeling, I mean, whatever strategy you have to do a model-independent search, it will always have this problem. <clears throat> but okay, but I prefer the, to be honest with you about it. All right, so um, one more step back to a technical thing, which is that uh, if you knew instead exactly what you were looking for, you could construct this ideal test statistic, which is just uh, Again, a likelihood ratio, it comes from Neumann Pearson's lemma that this is the best you can do if you know both distributions. And uh, we use this in two ways. So first, uh, to inspire us to construct our loss function as I showed you, and our test statistic. But secondly, we use it also uh, to assess the performance of the argument, right? Since you don't know what you're looking for, it's also hard to know what to compare the, 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 the p-value you get from here with. And we choose to compare it uh, with the ideal p-value. So we ask the question, if you knew exactly what you were looking for, what would your significance be? And then we compare with the network. Of course, the network is going to do worse by construction. But at least uh, we know that we're starting from reasonable signals, right? So I'm going to start with stuff that is five sigma or four sigma ideal and see what the network does. If you look at other papers that claim to have model independent searches, typically they, they never tell you what this number is, no? and they start with stuff that is like 30 sigma. And then, I mean, of course, we're going to see it. I mean, I would see it also if I were just to look at it. I mean, but anyway, okay. Uh, leaving uh, snide comments aside, I think I mean, you, if, if you. If you look at another talk like this, you should ask them what, what was the, the significance you were starting with. Because I mean, if you're starting with something that looks like uh, the standard model is a bump here and the, the data have a bump there and you have uh, 10 to the 10 events, I mean, you're not really showing that you're doing anything useful. Okay, anyway, so end, end of, the, of the monologue. The monologue uh, I'll summarize once more what we're doing. So give the network one data sample and one reference sample, and the output is this test statistic plus the log ratio. You do the same with many toy data samples, and you get a probability distribution uh, for the test statistic. And then from this probability distribution, you compute the p-value in the usual way, since you know what's the value of the test statistic on the data. If this p-value tells you that there is a significant deviation, you go and look into what the network has learned, that's one of the reasons I like this uh, setup is that the network is learning I mean, the data distribution so you can just check if it has learned something crazy or not. And if you can convince yourself that what the network has learned is really new physics and not a systematic effect, then last and most important step, you celebrate for a long time. Okay, so uh, this concludes uh, the description of the algorithm. And now, uh, well, let's see if it works. So if, if you looked at a bunch of distributions by eye and you couldn't really see anything, how would you figure out what what's going on other than that there's... I thought that, you know, generally in neural networks it was very hard to figure out what they were doing because the functions are so complicated. Yes, but, but uh, well, so what, what this is telling you is that you can, for example, select all the events that have a ratio learned by the network larger than some amount, right? So. If what the network has learned is close to zero, it means that these events are very standard model-like. So in some sense, you can isolate easily with a simple one-dimensional cut all the events that are uh, non-standard right. model-like, and then you can... The okay, rule if, is if, hard to figure out, but the events that are giving you this deviation are easy to find. Exactly, exactly. So it might be hard to understand what combination of kinematical variables in those events is giving you a peak, for example, right. but at least you can tell it's coming from these events. And right. if you see that they are crazy events, I mean, okay, then there are many ways to convince yourself that the excess is real or not. And minimally, you can just wait and collect more data and uh, see if looking just in that, uh, let's call it bin, but it's really a multidimensional bin, if your significance increases or not. So you, you could imagine to use this to direct future analysis and then do a traditional cut and count on those in that signal region. Okay, so uh, finally uh, some, some tests. And I'm going to tell you immediately that uh, they're all going to be toy examples. We are working now on uh, 
more reasonable signals, but toward, at, at, the very, at the end I will show you a comparison uh, with other methods, so to at least convince you that uh, we're not totally wasting our time. Okay, so there are three very obvious characteristics that you would like this uh, object to have. You want it to be sensitive to new physics, so if you start with uh, five sigma you don't want to get to zero, and uh, <coughs> You don't want to only see things that are 30 sigma. Uh, you want to be, you want it to be insensitive to cuts because if you go back to the chi square at the beginning, of course, if I had like, made a cut and looked only at the tail, that would have worked just fine. So if this thing ends up having a sensitivity that depends on where you're looking in your parameter space, then there is something wrong. I mean, you're essentially secretly doing a chi square. And finally, you want it to be model independent. So sensitive to many different shapes. Uh, okay, so let me show you a few toy examples. And in this case, we fix the size of the network and other parameters like the length of training, et cetera, et cetera, by n because it was enough. And then after I show you the toy examples, I'll tell you how we think we can choose the size of the network in general. Okay, so first toy example is the one you've seen 20 times now. Uh, Bottom line, ideal significance is 4.7 sigma, the network learns 3.2 sigma, and more importantly, if you do many data samples, the significances are correlated. So the network is actually finding the peak, it's not learning some random crap. Uh, I find this ratio pretty amazing. Okay, of course, I mean, there is an exponential here, so 4.7 and 3.2 are very different. But on the other hand, you have also to consider the huge look elsewhere effect. I mean, here you are essentially asking if any of the functions that the network can parameterize fits the data better than the standard model. The answer is always going to be yes. So there is a gigantic look elsewhere effect, and this reduction in significance is just that. So I'm, I'm still, yeah, okay. Looking at it, I'm still amazed that uh, it could do 3 sigma starting from 5. <clears throat> It was a pretty small network, to be fair, but still, I mean, it's large enough that it can do whatever. I mean, it can draw unicorns uh, in this one-dimensional distribution if it wants to. Okay, so uh, now cuts. Uh, again, I'm going to take this simple example and give the network, instead of the whole data set, something that goes from 0.3 onwards, 0.5 onwards, or 0.65 onwards. And... Uh, the network doesn't care, so this is good news. Uh, if you look at the distribution of the test statistic in the standard model hypothesis and in the new physics hypothesis, they're essentially the same within the statistical errors. And the different colors correspond to, correspond to different cuts. <clears throat> uh, finally, let's check other shapes, so an axis in the tail or a bump in the bulk. And it turns out that it works in exactly the same way. So the ratio between uh, the ideal and the neural network significances are the same as before. If you start with an ideal significance that is a bit smaller, you get a uh, neural network significance that is also a bit smaller. So so far, so good. They were all two examples, but uh, they, they did work. Huh? What is the like that? Oh, yeah. Well, it just means uh, that you are on this side, I mean, that you cannot really tell, uh, I mean, that you are in the bulk of the standard model distribution, but to the left of the median. So, I mean, anything below I mean, a certain number means that you haven't seen anything, essentially, that uh, your, your BSM looks the same as the standard model. Okay, so now, again, this is again a toy example, but it's a direct comparison between us and uh, our only competitors that we're aware of. Uh, so, so these guys uh, have also a very nice uh, model independent new physics search strategy. And one of the toy examples that they make are these two dimensional Gaussian. So we're going from one to two dimensions. And so their reference, their standard model is a Gaussian with mean one and uh, diagonal covariance matrix and variance one. And, there, and this is what we get for the test statistic in this case. Their, second, their, their signal example, their first signal example is the same notion but with the mean shifted a little bit. And here uh, they generate 10,000 events. So 
a 12% difference in mean with 10,000 events is big. I mean, it's a big difference. And they can see it at 2.2 sigma. We can see it at infinity sigma. I mean, the, the standard model distribution ends here. The, the, the new physics distribution for us starts here. So given the, num the number of toy examples I've generated, I can only say that uh, my significance is larger than 3.1 sigma, but in, in reality, I mean, just by looking at these, if you generate more toys, you're going to find a much larger significance. Uh, for the second signal example, same, I mean, they, they get a slightly bigger significance. We also do, I mean, this is more to the right. But again, given this, the number of toys that I've generated, uh, you can only say that it's larger than T.1 sigma. And let me stress that I've done this uh, without putting any effort in it. So no optimization of the network size, parameters, nothing. I mean, I just run it around the same network I had for this stuff in two dimensions, and it just came out. So presumably, we can do even better. But this is not to say that, I mean, you shouldn't take this plot to say that our model is fantastic, our algorithm is fantastic, it's actually the opposite. That these are very simple examples, but somehow they manage to still look bad in some other algorithms for finding them. Okay, sorry about this, but I mean, now because the problem is that if you read these papers, you cannot really tell. Like you, you see all these examples, and they say we see them, but then you don't know from what significance we're starting from. So. We, we have done, in some sense, difficult examples. So we look bad at face value if you just skim through the paper. But then, but then if you actually compare, it's another story. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so this is another one. Uh, in some sense, this is the father of us all. I think it's the first example I know of these kind of uh, ideas. Um, Again, I mean, I'm doing a comparison with them. So the, one of their uh, possible signals were, again, these n-dimensional Gaussians. Their standard model were centered around zero with variance one. Their uh, new physics were centered around zero with variance 0.95. And uh, all they show is that uh, they can always make a cut that uh, rejects all of the standard model in some sense. And since they've generated uh, 100 samples, this means that their maximum significance can be roughly 2.3 sigma. And uh, what we get, so uh, in five dimensions, again, we get uh, more than 3.1 sigma. So the, the two distributions are never touch each other. So I have uh, no overlap. Um, I don't know what would happen with more um, samples, but it's already but so it's hard to compare directly, right? Because uh, all they can say is this, who knows what happens if they generate more samples. But at least uh, from this, we can say that uh, we are no worse than them, for sure. Uh, in this case, uh, I have some outliers. So I end up with 2.2 sigma instead of 2.3, but it's roughly the same. And again, I haven't optimized anything at all. I just run everything out of the box. And you can see it by comparing the standard model distribution with this chi-square, which is important for the next and last uh, couple of slides, which are the following. So how do you choose what's the best network? Of course, there is no way to do it uh, rigorously, because you don't know what you're looking for. But we would like an algorithm that starts just from the standard model and tells you your network should be at least this big to properly describe the standard model. So this is already a starting point. <coughs> and, uh, and this is going to appear in a paper with uh, our CMS collaborators. And in particular, the person responsible for this nice argument was Gaia Grosso, who's a master's student in Padova. Uh, and um, we think she's very good. I don't know if she's applying or where, but uh, the next two slides are uh, uh, her work. So how, how do you fix this network architecture? So how many neurons you should have? And also, I'm putting under this name also the fact uh, that you have to choose for how long to train. So how many times do you take the derivative and move around in this space? And also, what's the right size for the weight clipping? And uh, the algorithm that she devised uh, used uh, something that we have noticed in the paper. So the fact that uh, asymptotically, 
the distribution of the test statistic in the standard model hypothesis should be a chi-square with the number of degrees of freedom of the network. Um, this is just comes from uh, other theorems by Neumann and Pearson. No, sorry, by Wilkins and Wald. <coughs> okay, so um, the first thing to do is the following. So fix a network architecture and then start with a very large weight clipping. So say 500. And then train the network and monitor the distance between the center of the standard model distribution and one of the outliers and the tail. Uh, more quantitatively, she's, for this purple curve, she's choosing the value of t that gives you a probability of 2.5% to be higher. Okay, so it's choosing the 97.5% quantile, but it's conventional. So you just pick a value of t in the middle of the distribution and a value of t in the tail and see how far apart they are. And you're going to see that if the weight clipping is too large, uh, then uh, this number diverges. So the more you train, the more they get far away from each other. This means that the network, as you keep training, is overfitting. So it's following more and more closely these single events in bins of zeros and ones. However, if you lower the weight clipping, it slowly loses the uh, power to do that. And at some point, you'll find that uh, this quantity plateaus. And so you're going to find a range of weight clippings for which this, this quantity plateaus as a function of the number of training. And now within this range, you would like to further refine and to refine and choose the special value of the weight clipping that gives you uh, <coughs> possibly the best performances, but this is to be uh, shown. What you do is that you look for uh, the value of the weight clipping for which the standard model test statistic distribution best follows the chi-square. Then you find a value, and then uh, you go back and uh, pick the minimum number of training rounds that uh, does not spoil these two steps. So you want uh, to be on the plateau, and you also want to be, so these are also training rounds, you also want to be in a region where the distribution follows a chi-square. <coughs> okay, so this explicitly selects the weight clipping and the number of training rounds, but implicitly also selects how big the network should be. Because uh, if you start with a network that is huge, uh, you're simply going to land on a very small value of the weight clipping. So if the network is huge, it doesn't matter. If you, do the, if you follow this procedure, it's just going to tell you that uh, your derivatives have to be very small, otherwise you overfit. On the other hand, if you start with a network that is too small, you're never going to reach the chi score in some sense, so you're going to be below. So, <coughs> sorry. So, what what is the weight clipping then? I thought it was the size of the network. No, the weight clipping is uh, the maximum value of the parameters inside the network. The size ah. is how many parameters you have. So, <coughs> yeah. Okay. So, following this procedure, you can have a network that is at least big enough to describe the standard model. Uh, actually, what I might have said that starting from too small of a network you never reach the chi square has to be investigated. Probably it's not true. But uh, in any case, following this procedure, you can start with a very large network and then uh, <coughs> find the appropriate weight keeping. And you can choose this very large size also by eye, by just counting how many variables you have and roughly how many parameters uh, you expect you need to describe them. <coughs> okay. So, at this point, you have a network that at least describes the standard model well. It's not refitting it. And at that point, I mean, it's up to you. You can proceed with this network or make it a bit bigger in view of having features that require more parameters than the standard model to, to represent. Okay. Uh, yes, so the, this was the very last uh, technical slide. It's just to say that uh, in the end, you prefer a smaller network computationally because it takes longer to get to the chi square if you have a bigger network. But okay, this is not so important. The important point was that we have an algorithm that at least can give us an idea of what all the hyperparameters, so size of network, weight clipping, and rounds of training should be. Um, and this brings me to the end. So uh, <coughs> There's nothing more than what uh, I've uh, roughly already said, so 
as our priors become weaker, it makes more and more sense uh, to search model independently everywhere we can, especially now that we have these huge data sets. And what we're, we tried to do was to use statistics to create something that uh, solves the problem that we truly care about. So data sets that in the bulk look like the model we know, and then have small but statistically significant deviations. <clears throat> and uh, all the toy examples on which we tested this method give us hope. And now we're working on uh, doing it in higher dimensions with actual signals and we'll see what comes out of it. Do you have any more questions? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if this um, uh, neural network te technology can be, or will be applied to previously um, analyzed data sets, say from LIP, or, mm -hmm. because you might have missed something using the old techniques. Yeah, in principle, I think you can. Uh, in practice, uh, it will depend whether we are able to convince the relevant experimentalists or not. I mean, as far as I know now, it's quite hard. Uh, like they have these lab data sets on like single computers sitting in some uh, offices at CERN, so you really have to find the right person. But uh, we, we would certainly like to see what happens. I mean, uh, we'll try our best. Maybe we'll try first to use it on the LHC data and then uh, iterate from there. But as you can see, we're still at a stage, uh, I mean, we're at a stage where we need to polish the conceptual issues still, so it's going to take some time even to get to the LHC data. But eventually, I'd love to use it also on that data. So how much can you do in Mathematica? Eh? Oh, this is all Mathematica. Okay. All you've seen today was Mathematica. Uh, so, at least you can go, for, for sure, from experience, I can tell you that you can go up to 5D. Uh, actually, this is all Mathematica. Well, so I can do like single samples on my laptop, but if you really want, here you have like 1,000 standard model and 300 uh, PSM. And for that, you need a cluster, but only because otherwise you would sit together forever. But it's not that the laptop is burning down. Uh, but. But okay, but uh, presumably, so in the follow-up work with all the signals, with the, all the real signals, our experimentalist friends are going like to give us the real computing power. I mean, like already now, what takes me I don't know two days, they can do it in half an hour. So I mean, <clears throat> you can do it in Mathematica, but uh, um, Although, actually, let me let me say something more because. But uh, if there is some particular search, let's say that something very limited, that yeah. you can you, in principle, do something very exotic? Yeah. I think you you can. I mean, it's only an issue of uh, where to store the events in the end. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't put all the events on, on the laptop, but if you can run mathematics on a cluster as we did, well, I don't see know, they, why not. They don't publish the, the data. Yeah. <laughs> a, this is a long discussion in itself. The LHC, yeah, yeah. they don't publish their data. You can't just get a list of four vectors from them. It's not publicly available. So they have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That way, yeah. yeah. I don't want to get into that because it also gets me very angry. But that's right. another story. Uh, but I'll say one more thing, which is that for these one dimensional and two dimensional examples, Mathematica and Python using Keras and uh, TensorFlow, so all the libraries uh, that were developed by Google and made public and people use uh, also in the applications of neural network were roughly the same speed. I don't know <laughs> if this is going to generalize to when you have more data and more dimensions, but at least for what I showed you today, Mathematica was state of the art in some sense. <laughs> so you can do it if you want. For example, in 70, they couldn't have so much data. When well, when but it's still data. like, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it always depends on, uh, on your, it depends more on the signal region you care about. I mean, if you go to some tail, uh, I mean, in these examples that I showed you, uh, yeah, so in the examples comparing with the others, there, you have like 20,000 events in each of these samples. In, uh, in my case, you have 2,000. 
but the limiting factor it's uh, the reference sample, which is the largest, which in all the examples I've used was 200,000. So if you go to a place where 200,000 events are enough to describe the standard model with sufficient statistical accuracy, and your actual data events are not many more than 200,000, you can do it with Mathematica. And there are certainly many Sigma regions, like, well, many, I don't know, but there are certainly some Sigma regions like that. <clears throat> but, but, I mean, but, but the moment that this, this goes into the collaborations, I mean, Mathematica is out of the window, also because it's not cool for them to do it in Mathematica, and then their friends would make fun of them. <laughs> they, <yeah. laughs> Do you have a particular search in mind for this? Like I was thinking multi lepton searches might be one where you could Yeah, so for what we are really doing in ER, it's much more basic. We're just doing uh, Z prime in the leptons and the Z prime to missing energy. So uh, a dark matter search and a resonance search. So very easy. Uh, then eventually, yeah, that, that could be one, but there could be many others. So we are really taking it in baby steps. We want to understand uh, the details. So <laughs> we're starting more simple than that, but then eventually we will get there. Any questions? Let's think of the other.